stairs and out to the front, but the staff at the front will help you and direct you out if you do hear a fire alarm, I'm sure we will be okay. Um, so yeah, so as I said, I am a teacher um, and I initially became a teacher because I wanted to make a difference in the world. I wanted to create change by teaching young people, our next generation, about equality and about fairness, but more importantly, about how to use their voices to create the change that they wanted to see in the world. Uh, and then I found the trade union movement and realised there was a place there to campaign and to fight for real change on a range of different issues as well. And I think the National Education Union is quite unique for a trade union because we can campaign not only on the issues that impact our members within the workplace, but we also campaign on wider social issues such as child poverty, free school meals um, and, and such like that. But for us to do that, we have to be organised and we have to work with other organisations as well to achieve change, which is why I'm very, very excited for the evening that we've got ahead for us this evening. Um, and I'm really excited Marshall is here this evening with us as well. It is actually Marshall's first tour of the UK and this is his inaugural speech or public lecture in the UK. So we are very, very excited to have him here at the NEU. But for us as a union, we are in heading to more strike action. We're in the middle of a, a huge campaign, which Kevin's going to talk a bit more about later, to demand a pay rise and support, more support for skills. So there isn't a better time for us as a union to be having this conversation as well, and to be having one of the most influential organisers in Marshall joining us today. As you probably know, Marshall is a veteran organiser with over 60 years organising experience in helping workers organising campaigns to win, including the United Farm Workers' successful efforts to secure better wages and working conditions for migrant farm workers in California. And he, like us, is someone who is very, very committed to the power of education, coaching and developing thousands of organisers across the planet through his organising, leadership and action programme at Harvard University and his global network, the Leading Change Network, who we're really, really pleased to be working alongside. And I didn't mention this earlier, Marshall, but a colleague of mine actually said he'd, he'd done your course earlier as well. I wasn't surprised because he's awesome, so he obviously learned a lot. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why this event is so critically important for us as a union. We are really trying to be an organising union. Um, so learning from others and working with others is really, really important to us. Um, as you all are very well aware, I'm sure, in Britain at the moment, the cost of living crisis, the crisis of inequality and stagnating wages for people across Britain, it demands that we organise better. And that's why having Marshall here today with us and the Leading Change Network, bringing all of you together in this room, not only teachers and educators from the NEU, but organisers from so many different Leading Change Networks and other organisations across the UK. And hopefully we're going to have a great evening working together, learning together and learning more about organising this evening. Um, we will have some time for questions later, but before um, we're going to get on with the rest of the agenda, before I hand over to Kevin and Marshall, I'm going to introduce Dan Firth, who is the Director of Campaigns at New Economics Foundation, and he's going to share a little bit about what he's learned from Marshall and the Leading Change Network. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Louise. Um, great to be here with you all. Some familiar faces as well, so good to see you all. Um, Britain's in a massive crisis, and Rishi Sunak's rise to become Prime Minister really reminds me of why I felt my calling to organise. Right across the UK and across the globe, we're gripped by a crisis of inequality, but we're also gripped by a crisis of power. Everyday people feel increasingly locked out of politics and increasingly in the grip of a minority of very wealthy elites. It takes me back to when I was 15 and I'd not long moved from the north of England, which was in the midst of the miners' strike, to Winchester, Europe's wealthiest city in Europe. I took my first paid job as a kitchen porter in Winchester College, one of Britain's most exclusive schools. It's where Britain's elites send their kids to learn how to rule Britain and to rule the world. And it's where I used to wash Rishi Sunak's pots. Every Saturday morning, I would walk past the Victorian double-fronted nana house to the back entrance, past the pig swill bins, and into the bowels of the school's kitchen. 
Putting on my kitchen apron, I'd wash dishes and prepare meals, whilst witnessing hundreds of boys sit down to eat together at these massive oak tables, surrounded by oil paintings of former empire builders. Being taught it was their birthright to rule. And I got to feel how Britain's elite also got to think about us. And I remember it making me feel so angry. You see, I didn't grow up believing that leadership was the birthright of the few. I had seen both my mum and my dad work unselfishly to uplift people. My mum worked with women who were survivors of domestic violence to discover their collective power. And my dad, a state school teacher, championed young people in care to demand themselves a good education. It was washing pots in Winchester College that taught me about Britain's deep inequality. But my mum and dad who showed me if we want a different kind of country, we have to build a different kind of leadership. But even when you know you have a calling like organising, there are times when that calling leaves you. I know quite a few people here have had similar experiences, whether as a teacher, a trade unionist or an organiser. And after I left the Labour Party in 2020, where I helped set up the community organising unit, I had really fallen out of love with organising and I wasn't sure if I'd get it back. But there are two people here in this room that helped me to rediscover that love. One is my wife, Jilly, whose birthday is just over there. And uh, the other is Marshall. Um, I met Marshall in 2018 at the beginning of setting up the Labour Party Community Organising Unit. He generously coached me around some of our organising strategy and did a public narrative session from some of our team. I think hands up who was in that training session. There are a few people here that were. Um, but in the midst of Brexit, two sets of local elections, a European election, a devastating general election, and so much internal conflict, we lost touch uh, for a while. Um, but when I left the Labour Party in 2020, when I never thought I wanted to organise again, it was reconnecting with Marshall that was totally transformative for me. Marshall really helped me to reflect on my own motivations. He, he guided me to rediscover my love of organising and reminded me that the answer to our biggest problems is not to give up on organising, but to prioritise it and get better at it, and also to share it. Uh, last year, Marshall introduced me to some fast, fantastic people from the Leading Change Network, like Mice and Imran, who are online tonight in Jordan and Pakistan. And since then, I've been able to build some amazing relationships with organisers across the world and continue to learn and rebuild my love of organising. As well as deepening relationships with some brilliant organisers, it really made me reflect on the state of Britain and why we have to, as organisers, continue to find ways to grow our community, support each other and learn together. What struck me in the UK is that unlike Britain's elite who have never ending dollars and networks, despite the growing number of organizers across the country, there are not many places where we can support each other, develop our craft together and learn together across organizations and movements. Um, but it's also about being part of something that's bigger than just the UK, a network of organizers where we can connect globally with other organizers and grapple with some of the global challenges that we face together, like the climate crisis. Which is why I decided with others in this room tonight, including Beth, Shingai, David, Emily, Ashraf, Francis and Jana, to set up the Leading Change Network UK. And one of the main reasons why Marshall is here today, to launch this network in the UK. So I'm really privileged to have been part of a fantastic team from LCN that brought Marshall to be with us today for his first ever tour. And as the son of a teacher to be here at the NEU with you to explore with friends about whether there is an appetite for us to challenge the crisis of inequality and power together. Thank you very much. We're now going to hear from one of our joint general secretaries, the awesome Kevin Carney. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we're all stopping you getting to Marshall, uh, but I'm so pleased to have Marshall here in the UK and in NEU head office, and you're all really welcome at NEU head office as well. Many of you will know of Marshall's lifelong commitment to struggle for social change 
from in the 1960s working with the student nonviolent organizing committees on voter registration amongst black people in the deep south to his work with agricultural workers in California in the 1960s, migrant uh, agricultural workers, to his work in the 2000s on uh, mobilizing a huge electoral effort around Barack Obama's campaign and many other campaigns in between. Uh, people can have good instincts about organizing and leadership, instincts that push in the right direction, such as leadership, as listening, as collectively strategizing, as ensuring others are involved at looking for winnable, you know, early victories. People can develop, have good instincts and people can develop experiences. But we think the contribution that M Marshall is making is ways of concentrating those experiences and codifying them to try and make leadership more learnable so we can understand them and apply them in our context here in the UK, in our political context, in the actual unions and movements we're working in. And Marshall's worked through his instincts and his long experience to produce those insights, and that's what you're going to get from him. My job is to say something very, very brief about the political context in the UK and in our unions. And uh, it's not a pretty sight. There's been a four decade long decline in the amount of industrial action in the United Kingdom. The number of days lost to strike action and in many years in the 2000s was lower than the number of days lost to strike action in 1943 during the Second World War. These are astonishing figures, not only strike days, but union membership, union density, coverage of collective bargaining agreements, all of those declining across that sort of 40 year period. And there are lots of explanations of why that 40 year decline has happened. And you have to engage them a bit because you want to have some hope that they're coming to an end, that there's going to be some change, which I really believe there is. So the different sorts of explanations you hear are, it was the effect of the defeat of the miners' strike, the introduction of Thatcher's anti-union laws, the rollout of privatization, atomization of working people, the opening, people don't all talk, I think this is a really important thing, the opening of the Eastern European economies, uh, millions of skilled workers to the Western economy when the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, there are other explanations. Some say it's the result of union leaderships not being ambitious enough, just being bureaucrats. Whatever the explanation, and it might be all of those, some of them, none of them, uh, whatever the explanations, the decline is very real. And the consequences of that decline are really scary. In my view, that decline in union strength and power is the fundamental reason why our country is becoming more and more unequal with all the implications for our society. The last long decade since 2010 or 2008 even has made things worse for working people. Childhood poverty has gone up dramatically. Student tuition fees trebled. And for working people, the lowest wage growth, growth in the OECD, the longest period of wage suppression in any of those advanced economies and further growth in inequality. So that's terrible. But we're in a period where it's starting to change, which is good. Unions are now much more likely to be able to win big ballots and engage members, both large ballots in some of the public sector unions, like the NEU has, has passed thresholds, like UCU has passed thresholds, and in many private sector disputes where Unite GMB are winning ballots in factories and then winning pay rises. And there are some, there are those huge and inspiring organizing campaigns like the GMB campaign at Amazon at the moment. It's not all plain sailing and not all disputes are winning and overall membership in the TUC unions declined again last year uh, when there's been some recent years of growth. So it's not all in the right direction, but things are changing and they are changing in the right direction. They're even changing in the right direction despite the context of the Conservatives introducing even more anti-union laws in 2016 with those huge thresholds that we have to win in postal ballots, 50% of all members taking part. For us in the NU, 40% of all members have to vote yes, or you can't take a one-day strike, as well as a 50% turnout. And 
for some time, we haven't been able, since those laws were introduced in 2016, we weren't able to pass those thresholds in the NEU. We tried a couple of times, we couldn't pass those thresholds. We could in smaller disputes at school level, sometimes at local authority level, but we couldn't pass them at national level. And now we can. There is a change. The spike in inflation with very real effects on people following the long period of wage suppression since 2010 has angered and mobilized people. I wonder whether it's also partly the experience of COVID where the contributions that people made have just been ignored by government, but for whatever reason, things have changed. And since maybe I think, and this is also matters that since 2016, those laws, unions have improved their technological capacity, improved their rep training. We've done lots of things to be in this place. And now we can pass thresholds. We can take action. The NU's had six days of strike action. We've just called another two. We're using those strike days imaginatively to increase pressure on the employer or the government. We're getting uh, public support. And so this is crucially the bit where we get to the questions that Marshall will just tell us how to solve. Or may, may, will this moment pass for British trades unions or can we avoid it passing? Can we turn these disputes into wider support for changing our public service, wider public engagement with our campaigns? Can we turn it into wider union renewal? What do we have to learn about how to lead in this moment? I'm hoping, and I know that Marshall will provoke us and inspire us to look for the change that working people lead. Thank you very much. I'm going to go up there if it's okay, Marshall, because I would like to really take all of this in. So Marshall's now going to deliver his Oh, okay. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening. Good evening. All right. Let's try it. Good evening. A little more energy. Good evening. All right. Good. Just checking that the communication is working, that the sound's working, and the spirit is present. So um, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, uh, Louise, uh, Andrew uh, from the union, uh, uh, Dan, and all the crew from LCN and everyone for this opportunity to learn with you this evening, uh, reflect on the challenges that we're facing. Uh, but um, let me just say, uh, this is not gonna be about answers, okay? It's gonna be about questions, it's gonna be about provocation, and hopefully it can be an invitation to a journey in which we can begin to actually find answers and create them. I wish I had the little blueprint, just check it off, but no, that's, that's not what's happening. What, what is happening is uh, my friend Tom Hayden used to say that change is slow, except when it's fast. And uh, we're in a fast moment, aren't we? Uh, you know, chickens come home to roost, uh, debts become due, uh, the galloping inequality uh, over the last 40, 50 years uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, demonstrating its effects. And the thing about it is a moment like this, a fast moment, a moment of, of shift and, and change. The question is, can we approach it with fear or with hope? In other words, uh, is this kind of change opportunity that's happening in the midst of it? Is it something we need to protect ourselves from or is it something that we must engage with? Uh, I think, there really, there is no choice because to protect us from it is not going to help. It doesn't, you know, building walls doesn't take fear away. It just keeps you afraid because you depend on the wall. It's engagement that can move toward courage and toward a change that we need to do. So I just wanted to sort of frame this as an effort not to deny the rapidity of the change, the consequences. I mean, climate wasn't even mentioned, but this is big stuff. But to not, how can I say, there's nothing easy about this, but it depends on how we approach it. And if we approach it with courage, 
then the chances are we can begin to find ways through. So I'll say a bit more about this later, but this is more of an invitation, not to an answer, but to get on a path to find answers and to get on that path with others. Uh, it's an invitation to learning. Uh, in other words, in the context of change like we're in, if we're not learning all the time from what we're doing, what's working, what's not working, what might work and trying things, then we're just, we become increasingly irrelevant. So the centrality of learning to an encounter with this kind of moment, I think is also crucial. So it's particularly appropriate that we're here at the teachers union, uh, at the education uh, union, uh, more correctly. And I'll just share that my mom was an educator and she insisted on that word because it comes from the Latin educare, which means to draw out, not to put in. In other words, that the work is to draw out of people uh, what's implicit, to become explicit, their capacity, their strength, their understanding, rather than trying to fill people's heads with things, uh, which is not really what education is all about. And the last just general comment I want to make is that um, a Protestant theologian, Walter Brueggemann, uh, wrote a book called Prophetic Imagination, which he says that um, transformational vision occurs at the intersection of two elements. One he calls criticality, a clear view of the world's need, uh, of the world's needs, its pain, uh, coupled with hope, a sense of its promise and possibilities. One without the other goes to despair or it goes to irrelevance, but together they can create a tension that can be powerfully transformational. And it's, it's that encounter, recognizing the challenge, but also accessing the sources of hope. And by hope, I don't mean flowers in May, everything's gonna be great, whoops. I'm not even mean optimism. I'm talking, uh, the best definition I know of is uh, that by uh, the 12th century philosopher Maimonides who said, hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. In other words, it is always probable Goliath will win, but sometimes David does. It was utterly improbable. We would elect a black man president of the United States in 2007, but it happened. In other words, hope is that place between fantasy and certainty. It's the could be. It's the place of imagination. It's the pace of possibility. And we have in our own lives those experiences. So that's the context in which I'm using the word hope. Now, uh, we're going to talk about leadership and about organizing. And so I want to be clear about what I mean by leadership. Um, there's as many different definitions as there are people who talk about leadership, I think. So I want to be clear what our approach is. Our approach is based on these three questions posed by first century Jerusalem scholar Rabbi Hillel, who when asked, how do I figure out what to do with my life? Responded with three questions to ask yourself. And the first question is to ask yourself, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Now, that's not meant to be a selfish question. It's meant to be a self-regarding question. If you are going to engage in leadership as a relationship as opposed to a performance, you need to be clear what you bring to it, what you expect from it, and approach it with enough self-awareness that you can actually see other people other than simply a reflection of yourself. So it's paying attention. Who, who, what, why am I here? What am I for? But the second question is, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what, a human being and not a thing, is to recognize that we are relational creatures. We exist in relationship with others in the world. Our capacity to, change, to achieve our objectives is inextricably wrapped up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. And finally, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? Uh, not advice to jump into moving traffic. It's a caution against what Jane Adams called the snare of preparation. Just another year of strategic planning. We'll have the perfect plan, then we'll implement it, and the world will totally conform to our expectations. Yeah, appropriate laughter. Does that ever happen? Yeah, I know where I teach, it's like just another degree, and I'll have all the answers. Uh, that doesn't turn out to be the case either. The point is that rarely can we learn to do well what we want to do until we actually be, until we actually do it, begin to do it that understanding flows from action, not preceding it. And so for me, the interaction of these three elements of the self with the other with action and action in this way is a lot of what leadership and organizing are all about. Now, 
when you think about leadership this way, though, um, I don't know, in your organizations, you ever had the experience in campaigns or organizations when things are going really well and people line up to, to say, where's the leadership so we can thank them? Yeah, what's the last year about? When do people say, who's in charge? When do people say, who decided that? When? Can't hear you. Huh? Huh? Oh, there's challenges, there's problems, there's dilemmas. See, the, the point is that when everything's working, the system's working, what do you need leadership for? What do you need the creative, initiative-taking, adaptive capacity for leadership? Everything's working, don't need it. So it can be daunting because there never will come the time when everything is under control. That's just not going to happen. If it happens, you're out of a job. They don't need you anymore. Because leadership is about dealing with those kinds of dilemmas. And so you, you ask yourself, do I have the skills to deal with these new challenges? And that's a challenge to the hands. Um, can I use my resources in new ways uh, to uh, get what I need in order to face these challenges? And that's a challenge to the head, a strategic challenge. And then there's, where do I get the courage? Where do I get the hope? How do I inspire the hope and courage in others to take the risks that are often necessary in order to deal with real challenges and real changes? And that's a challenge to the heart. So it's a way of thinking of leadership in a head, hands, heart way. And we often focus so much on the head and the hands and we forget about the heart. And the heart is what actually moves us. And we're going to say a bit more about that. So the definition that I've come to use for leadership is this. It's about accepting responsibility because there is a choice. Accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. Now, so this is not leader as diva, okay? This is not leader as the sun that illuminates with its rays or burns with them or whatever it might be. This is a form of engagement and relationship with others around the accomplishments of shared purpose. And there is real craft and there is real skill in this context. So enabling others to achieve shared purpose un in the, uh, under conditions or in the face of uncertainty. Now, organizing is a particular form of leadership as I understand it, in which the first question is not what's my issue, but who are my people? With whom am I engaging in this relationship? Who are my people? And in terms of their lived experience, in terms of the pain points and the hope points, what is the change that they need? Not because a study said they needed it, but because people need it. And finally, how can I work with them to enable them to turn their resources into the power that they need to achieve that change? So this is different from providing services to clients, which may be a good thing, it's not organizing, or marketing products to customers not organizing either. Organizing is about bringing people together around a, as a constituency. And constituency, I use the word because it comes from the Latin constare, which means to stand together. In other words, it is to bring people together, to stand together, learn together, decide together, act together, and hopefully win together. So this is kind of at the heart, I think, of organizing which also means that at the heart of organizing is power. And that word, you know, I don't know, sometimes it sounds like a bad word. I, mean, I, I think it may be because people have a lot of it, don't want the rest of us to talk about it or something like that. In Spanish, poder just means to be able to. Uh, and uh, Dr. King de de described as the capacity to achieve purpose. But it's really intuitive. If you need what I've got more than I need what you've got, who's got the power? If you need what I've got more than I need what you've got, who's got the power? Can't hear you. All right, and if it's reversed, who's got the power? Okay, the point is that power is a relationship that is not a thing. It is a relationship between need and resource, interest and resource. And when you begin to think of power in that way, it becomes many different points of intersection and engagement because there's many different points where you can address the question, well, 
if we collaborate with one another, we have shared interests, we can build more power with each other, like a credit union, a collaborative. But if resources we need are controlled by someone who exercises power over us, then we have to figure out how to turn that around by discovering what needs the other has that we have resources that we can address. There's a, there's a saying in, in a Mexican saying, uh, uh, which means people don't come and look at the pregnant pear cactus except when it's bearing fruit. And that's used to describe the way politicians show up in the barrios just before elections. Oh, there's some fruit here. Mm, let me come and get some fruit. And then they disappear. The point is that is a need that they have. The question is how do we leverage that need in order to get what we need? So. It really, the, the question of power is just is so fundamental here. And one last thing about this, uh, Stephen Luke's uh, uh, wrote this book called Power Radical View, where he talks about power as having three faces. And the, the first one, uh, when we saw George Floyd being murdered in Minneapolis, it was pretty clear who was holding the power in that moment, wasn't it? Pretty clear. Who cared who won, who lost. But then you have to ask, well, wait a second, who authorized that? Who said that was okay? Who made those rules? Why are those rules the way they are? How did that person get the authorization to do what they did? That takes you to a second level of power about who decides, who decides what the rules are. And then people may say, well, why wasn't this problem dealt with for a long time? Well, to find the answer to that question, you have to ask, given the status quo, who's benefiting and who's losing? Because that's the only way you can begin to make bare the structural dimensions of power within which we struggle. And in organizing, the challenge is often how to confront the immediate pain shift that's needed, but in such a way that we build the power to get at the second and the third face of power as a structural thing. So uh, that's kind of uh, a bit about power. Now, finally about organizing in general um, we think of it as having three outcomes not just one the first outcome is uh did we win the election or did we get the law or did we solve the problem but a second outcome which is probably even more important um did we come out of this stronger than we were when we went into it or weaker have you ever been experienced in a campaign where you may even win, but you'd never want to see anyone else ever again who was in the campaign? Yeah, it's a familiar. So really, what did you win? You came out of it weaker, not stronger. The whole point of the campaign is to build collective strength. It's to organize, it's to build organization and capacity. And so unless we're conscious of that too, so that we approach problem solving in such a way that it builds our organizational capacity, then we're sort of missing the point. We do campaign after campaign after campaign, but we're never building the power that we need in order to actually go deep. The third outcome here at the individual level is, are we developing leadership? Because in, in my understanding, the core to effective organizing is leadership development, is developing with, with people the capacity to do the kind of work that leadership requires, which is what we'll be talking about in just a moment. Um, um, what's this? <laughs> what do you think this is? I mean, it's a bicycle. Huh? Okay, let me put it this way. Uh, how many people learn to ride a bicycle? You learn, okay. And you learn by studying bicyclology, right? or YouTube or social media, what do you have to do? You need to get, and what's the first thing that happened? You get on a bike, fall. That's your moment of truth. That's when you went home, went to bed, or you found the courage to get back up on that bike, knowing you're gonna keep falling for a while because it is the only way you can learn to keep your balance. In my experience, that's how we learn any practice. We get on the bike and it's not perfect and we make mistakes. And that is necessary data for our own learning and development. It's sort of so important to create a context in which people are not afraid to learn, which means not afraid to make mistakes, not afraid to fail, 
because only with that comes the possibility of learning. There's an educational psychologist, Carol Dweck, who distinguishes between what she calls fixed mindset and growth mindset. And fixed mindset is approaching a new learning, uh, learning something new as a judgment on who you are, like I am smart, I am dumb, I am wise, I am stupid, whatever. Um, that's fixed mindset. And of course, our defenses kick in. On the other hand, growth mindset is to approach this as uh, negative or, or critical feedback as data on my learning. And I need that data in order to learn. And so we invite people to take a growth mindset when we're working on organizing practices and how to learn them, because it always involves getting on the bike. And so we're not, we don't, we're, we're going to see a little bit of that this evening. We don't have a time for a lot of it, but I wanted to put it out there because nobody learns to organize from hearing a talk. Nobody learns to organize from reading a book. People learn to organize by organizing. And that doesn't mean you wait till you're some kind of expert. It means you start and then you learn and then you reflect. And that's really how this, how this uh, process works. Now, I wanted to say one thing about this. It's kind of core to the way we approach uh, teaching and learning organizing. Um, would you think of a moment in which you felt disrespected? Can you think of a moment, a particular moment, in which you felt disrespected? What, what did it feel like? What are the words? What did it feel like? Angry, what else? Huh? What else? Upset, what else? Yeah, doesn't feel too great. What about a moment, again, a specific moment in which you felt respected, which you really felt respected? What did that feel like? Buoyant, what else? Emboldened, very good, what else? I'm sorry? Oh, value, yes. And what else? Seems like it's a little better than the other one. Yeah. Now, what about a moment in which you felt respect for someone else? A moment when you felt respect for someone else. Connected, what else? Inspired. Yeah, what else? Yeah, ah, something to learn here. What else? Oops. Hopeful. Hopeful. Now, what about a moment when you, and be honest, when you felt disrespect for someone else? How'd that feel? I'm sorry? Fire, so sorry, what else? Yeah, what else? Angry. It seems like we're better off to both give and receive respect, don't you think? And the reason I'm, I'm saying this is when we get into learning practice, there's a vulnerability that's essential to the learning. And so if we can't agree on terms of respect, then we're not gonna be learning. And so creating a, a context in which we can learn and not just be competing who's, who's putting who down or all that other stuff, uh, then we begin to learn. But without this, I think we have a hard time. When you boil it down, it really just seems to boil down to three things. One is to be seen and know that you're being seen to be heard and know that you're being heard and to be valued and know that you're being valued. And so when we do workshops and campaigns, we ask everyone to commit to this kind of understanding and practice of respect. Does that make sense? Yes, good idea, bad idea. Okay, unfortunately we won't get to practice too much tonight, but uh, uh, no, oh wait, that's a mistake. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, just, uh, I, I wanted to say a bit about where the frameworks that I'll be sharing with you come from. Um, and and we, we use frameworks to explain what we're doing. We use concepts and so forth. Um, you know, I think one of the big mistakes we make is when we confuse a framework with the thing itself. Uh, there's something called the alignment problem where, where um, you know, we, the premise is all models are wrong. Uh, and what that means is that the world's complex. And anytime we create a model, 
then we're, it's, it's an abstraction. It's a theory. It's a hypothesis that if these things happen, that will happen. That's all it is. It is not reality itself. And sometimes we get confused and we think the model is reality. And then we start shaping reality as if it were the model. And that explains the economics profession for the last 50 years, I think. And I think you know what I mean. And so uh, it's understanding that concepts and frameworks are just scaffolding. They're scaffolding for learning practices and practices is really the heart of the matter. Now, my introduction to, to uh, organizing uh, came when I was uh, a junior at Harvard College and volunteered for the Mississippi Summer Project in 1964. And the Summer Project was an effort to support the work of African-American organizers in Mississippi who were uh, fighting for the right to vote. Uh, and uh, the problem was the law did not protect them. They were being beaten, put in jail or worse. And so the idea was to recruit people who might bring the law with them, like white students from elite colleges, black students from elite colleges in the North uh, that might bring the law with them. Uh, and our mission was to organize something called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was a parallel to the segregated Democrats. And then it would go to the Democratic National Convention, challenge the segregated Democrats to our own party to be seated. We were in Oxford, Ohio, where we were being trained uh, at a school there, about 300 of us. And it was the night before it was time to go to Mississippi. And we got word that three of our party had disappeared. Uh, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. They had gone down a week earlier and been assigned to investigate the burning of a black church in Philadelphia, Mississippi, where there had been civil rights activity, and they had not been heard from since. Uh, Bob Moses, the lead organizer, uh, was a very soft-spoken guy, called us all together, came up on the stage and said, we heard what happened to our brothers. We don't know exactly what happened, but we think they're gone. And sure enough, two months later, their bullet riddled beaten bodies were found buried in a dirt levee where the Klan had buried them after executing them when the county sheriff had turned them over to the Klan for that, for that purpose. Now, we didn't know that, but we kind of knew them. And so Bob was saying, look, I, I like to tell everybody, just forget it, go home. I said, but I can't, I have to ask you to go. But, but he said, I can't take the whole responsibility. Every, everybody here has got to sign. Well, I sank into my seat in complete silence, just like everybody in that room. And you say, whoa, wait a second. What did I sign up for here? And you ask yourself these questions about why does this matter so much? Why does it matter? Why do I care so much? My father was a rabbi, my mother a teacher. He served as a chaplain in the American army. And we lived for, in Germany for three years after the Second World War, where a lot of his work was, this, was with Holocaust survivors. My fifth uh, birthday party was in a, what was called DP camps, displaced person camp. Uh, that was all children, which at first I thought, I thought was cool until I understood why it was only children, the parents were gone. So the Holocaust was reality in our home, but my parents interpreted it to me, not as being simply about anti-Semitism, but about racism and that racism kills. Turn people into objects, you can do anything with them. Civil rights movement was, challenging the institutionalized racism that's been fundamental to my country since before its founding. Now, I don't know, are there any PKs here? You know what a PK is? Oh, we got one, we got one. Hey, what kind of PK are you? Uh, I'm sorry? Okay, kind of cost. PK, you know what we're talking about? Oh, we got another PK. A double. A double PK. Uh, and two Anglican priests. Okay, all right. Yeah, it means preacher's kid. Uh, and, uh, and it has certain things like you got to show up at all this stuff. You're also supposed to be perfect, which is a different issue for a senior. That's for a support group. Yeah, that's a different deal. But I, I did love the Passover Seder, the, the, the meal that is the telling of the Exodus story of this journey from slavery to freedom. And they would look at the kids and say, you were slaves in, free, in Egypt. I said, no, I've never been a slave, never been to Egypt. It took me a while to understand what it meant was that that story was not the property of one people or time or place. It's told generation after generation. You kind of have to figure out where you are. In. You were the guys with the horses and the chariots, or are you over there with the people trying to find their way to a land of promise? 
And Dr. King described the civil rights movement as yet another chapter in that story. Now, I was 20 at the time, others were 18, 19, 21, 22. Civil rights movement was a movement of young people. You know, it's important. Dr. King, when he led the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, was 25. And it's not an accident. You remember the quote I, uh, earlier about Walter Brueggemann uh, talking about criticality and hope? Young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find, almost of necessity, hopeful hearts. And so there's a deep affinity between generation change and social change. And that was so certainly in my generation. And I believe it is and needs to be and must be in this generation as well. Otherwise, we don't have a future unless we are really engaging with creating it. As we're sitting there in silence, a young woman in the back, Jane Wheeler, she a SNCC organizer, she stands up, she starts to sing. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. They say freedom is a constant struggle. Oh Lord, we've struggled so long, we must be free. They say freedom is a constant dying, we've died too long, we must be free. And as she stood up and walked out of the room, everybody filed in behind her. And the next day, everybody went to Mississippi. Now, for me, that was a choice point uh, because it was in Mississippi really where I would find my calling. And by calling, I use that word intentionally, not my career, not my job, but what I'm here to do, uh, why I'm here. And, you know, with, with all due respect to Harvard, my education about race, power, and politics in America was not at Harvard, it was in Mississippi. The evident inequalities between whites and blacks, everything, housing, healthcare, education, you name it. But it was also clear that bringing a few medical supplies or books wasn't gonna change much. It's when I began to learn the difference between charity and justice. The charity says, what's wrong, let me help. Justice says, why is it happening? Let's change it. And when you say, let's change it, you get pushback because you often find that these people do not have enough because these people have too much. And so of course you get pushed back. And then you find yourself in a power struggle. And then you find yourself looking for resources to challenge those who are exercising power over you. Now, the lesson the civil rights movement taught all of us was from, how many people heard of Rosa Parks? The lady who one day got tired and wouldn't give up her seat? Yeah, actually, she was secretary of the NAACP chapter. She would train in organizing, I learned to school. It was all a strategy to file a lawsuit based on the Supreme Court decision the year before about the segregation being unconstitutional and apply it to the buses. Because the buses have blacks in the back, whites in the front, no man's land in the middle, armed deputized bus driver in the front. So a black person would have to walk past all that, find a seat in the back. And if a white person wanted the seat, they had to get up and give it to them. Twice a day. Think about the anger in that community. And so they wanted to file, so they, they Rosa got arrested, filed. but the women's committee, the black college said, it's not enough. Uh, we gotta show solidarity. And they convinced Dr. King and the others to call for a one day, uh, we would just all stay off the buses. And there's a great account of the, the uh, Monday morning when it was to start, Dr. King gets up early and sees the buses going by. There isn't a single black face on the single bus. Now, at that moment, that community saw itself differently. Powerlessness fragments you, but that kind of unity empowers. So that night, they said, well, we stayed off one day. We're just going to stay off until we win. And they did. It took a year. But in the end, they did win. And in the course of that, they discovered that they all had a critical resource. What do you think I might be talking about? Well, yeah, money was part of it, but even more fundamental. Huh? Yeah, what part of people? Now, what else? More specific. What do you see when you look down? What do you see when you look down? Everybody have feet. Now, if they if they use their feet to walk to work and deny the bus company the bus fare instead of using their feet to get on the bus and give the bus company the bus fare, then the bus, their dependence, their individual dependence on the bus company could be flipped into the bus company's dependence on an, uh, a solid, a solid, solidary. Uh, uh, organized community. And that flip from individual resource to collective power was really at the heart of what organizing was all about. And it's why it wasn't the lawyers that won the civil rights movement, it was ordinary people finding a way to use their resources creatively in that way. Well, I got hooked on that. 
instead of going back to Harvard to finish my senior year, it seemed irrelevant. I wrote him a note, I'm gonna come back and study history, we're busy making history. Instead, I went back to California where I, I grew up in Bakersfield in the oil and agriculture uh, town in the San Joaquin Valley. Cesar Chavez had just started organizing migrant farm workers, mostly immigrants from Mexico. And I had grown up in that world, I hadn't seen it. I had to go to Mississippi and come back with what we called Mississippi eyes to see another community of people of color, also without political rights, also without economic rights. And California with its own rich history of racial oppression going back to the native peoples, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Filipinos, and of course, Mexicans. So it turned out Mississippi was not an exception to America. It was an example of the America we needed to change. So I began to work with Caesar, did that for the next 16 years, which was really, I think of getting my calling in Mississippi, but learning the craft with the farm workers because we were organizing a union, we were organizing community organization, we were organizing boycotts. Uh, it was, and organizing was taken really seriously. It was taught as a craft and everyone was expected to learn this craft. In other words, the skill, that was just fundamental to it. Uh, I left the farm workers in 1981, did another 10 years of union issue and electoral work, mostly in California, and was then invited by 25th reunion at Harvard. Um, now I was surprised because I was a dropout. I didn't know they invited dropouts to come to reunions. Uh, and I wasn't that guy up in Seattle who started a small software company who dropped out of Harvard. Uh, who, that was not me, uh, but, or the other guy who dropped out and started, what do we call it, Facebook? No, you know, awful. No, that wasn't my situation, but I was feeling stuck. I'd been working with Jerry Brown trying to reorganize the California Democratic Party. It was really thankless. So I went to this reunion, first one, and it was like 20, running against a 20 year old me. 20 year old me says, how's it going? I said, I don't know, I'm feeling stuck. Well, why don't you come back and finish that senior year? Oh, I don't know, I didn't, you know, the synapses may not work. And uh, you know, the tuition had changed a little bit, the intervening period of time, but we figured it out. And so in 1991, I came back finished my senior year, wrote a senior thesis in history and government, and graduated class of 64 92. And, 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 and my 81 year old mother got to come and see her son finally become a college graduate. And the patients paid off. But I got the bug, did a master's then at the Kennedy School, a PhD in sociology. And while I was working on the PhD, I was asked to design a course on organizing, which turned out to be a gift to me because there's a way I could integrate my life experience, the social science I was learning in a pedagogical conversation with a rising generation. You know, it was like, I got to go to class. I get to go to class twice a week and have a conversation with the future. I mean, how cool is that? And it's powerfully generative and I think a source of real learning for, for all of us. So I've been on the faculty full-time since 2000, teach organizing online, offline, public narrative online, offline, and got back into the world of practice really through my students, particularly with the Obama campaign in 2007 where we took a lot of these practices that we've been developing and put them to work in a way that it turns out they actually could work. In other words, the way I approach being at the university is it's a way to connect research, practice, and teaching. Pedagogy practice. In other words, I treat my classes as laboratories. It's where we try stuff. We figure out stuff. But what we're figuring out is practice because it's practice is where the action is. And so, uh, let me just flip here. Uh, th somebody put this in here. Th th this is not supposed to be here. Uh, this is uh, pictures. Believe it or not, I'm in these pictures. Uh, that was one with Cesar Chavez. One in the middle is with uh, Dorothy Day, the leader of the Catholic worker movement, some of you may be familiar with. The one on the right uh, was with uh, uh, Dora Suerta and, and Joan Baez and a delegation of Yemeni farm workers who came and worked in the grapes. And one of their brothers was the first person to be killed on a farm worker picket line in California, uh, Najit Akula. And this is at a huge Muslim funeral attended by primarily Mexican farm workers uh, in California. This was a strike in Plano. This is planning a boycott and so forth. Anyway, those were the days. All right, that's not where we are. Okay, so, um, how many of you have ever been in a disorganization? Yeah, what's a disorganization? Yeah, it's these people raising their hands. Uh, yeah, we once tried to put together what are the characteristics of a disorganization and um, passivity. Um, you know, people don't show up stuff. 
divided. I don't mean differences of opinion, but I mean deep divisions, factions, the kind of thing uh, that undermines uh, collective effort. Uh, drift, just, you know, we're drifting along. Uh, reactiveness, hard time making decisions, but we, uh, we react when someone makes a decision that affects us like chickens with our heads cut off. And in action, we may have resources, but they're not being used. Any of this sound familiar? It's pretty awful because if our power depends on, on collective action, this is the opposite. So we made a list of the promised land over here. Uh, what would it look like to have be an organization, be active instead of passive? There'd be unity instead of division. There'd be purpose instead of drift. There'd be initiative instead of reactiveness, and there would be change instead of inaction. How many people have been in one of these, an organization like this? Oh, really? Oh, that's sad. Okay. <laughs> well, we, no, well, we have some work to do because what was the answer? What is the answer? We did a whole study to figure out. We had a bunch of boycott cities around, around the U.S. Some were working, some not. We're trying to figure out why some worked. And we had lots of theories about, well, the unions are strong, churches are strong. It all boiled down to one thing. What was the one thing? Here revealed for the first time, leadership. But it wasn't leadership as somebody had a great personality or somebody gave a great speech. It wasn't that at all. It was, the, it was practices. In other words, leadership is a practice. It's not a thing. It's not a what, it's a way of doing things. And if there was activity instead of passivity, it was because someone was doing the work of turning the values into the kinds of narratives that created courage and unity. If there was unity instead of division, it's because people were building relationships with intentionality with each other. If there was purpose instead of drift, it was because there was a clear structure for making decisions, for coordination, for accountability. Initiative instead of reactiveness, strategizing, somebody was strategizing. And if there was change instead of inaction, it was actually turning resources into facts on the ground, votes in the ballot box, uh, whatever it might be. And so the, the approach that we take then is based on those five practices. Uh, first, storytelling, I'll say a bit more in a minute, relationship building, structuring, strategizing, and acting. And the idea is that these are practices that we can learn, they take what we, most of these things, if you look at this, these are things we all know how to do. I mean, who has ever told a story? I mean, you know, who's ever had a relationship? I don't say a good one, but who's ever had a relationship? Who's ever had a relationship? Uh, who's ever created expectations with somebody else about you're gonna meet? So this structure, who's ever had to strategize? You know what I'm talking? You ever oversleep in the morning and you still have to get to work and you have to find a new way to get to work? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you're strategizing. That's what strategy is. It's, it's figuring out how you can still use your resources to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. And of course, action. We know the difference between showing up and not showing up. So these are all basic human competencies. And what we've been trying to do with our work is uh, present them as craft so that they can be learned. This goes back to point made at the beginning now. Leadership is central to the whole thing. And so um, what do you think this is? You ever been one of these? You see what that, you see that dot? You ever been a dot? You know, you ever tried to work with a dot? Really? Doesn't it? Who's been a dot? Come on, fess up. Huh? Everybody comes to you. Everything comes to you. You burn out, they burn out. Right? It's a problem. And we need to acknowledge it as a problem. You know, it's who said that leadership is a one person deal? I mean, wh where was that written? You know? So sometimes we react so strongly to the dot that we decide we don't need any leadership. We don't need any structure. Forget it. You had that experience? And that usually goes here, <laughs> all over the place. Uh, feminist sociologist Joe Freeman wrote an article called The Tyranny of Structurelessness. And she started saying in this circumstance, people are still making decisions, but they're hidden. They're off the books. They're not transparent. 
And so better to be transparent than own it. And there is an alternative, which we began developing seriously with the Obama campaign in 2007, which is to think in terms of leadership teams. Now by a team, I don't mean a whole bunch of people. I mean, a team as explicit as a football team is a team or a string quartet is a team. It's specific, it's, it's, it's clear who is on the team, it's bounded, there are clear roles and understanding. And what we began to do in that campaign, instead of having precinct leaders, we were developing precinct teams. And it really was a big shift because first of all, nobody thought they had to do everything. Uh, leadership was understood as interdependent, what we do together. That, that for me to succeed, you need to succeed. We're not competing. We're actually interdependently collaborating, which is a very different way to approach things than is how they're, they're often approached. And so uh, it, it paid off in terms both of motivation and accountability, because you weren't just out there facing the elements all by yourself. Then scale was the question, what do we do? So then we figured out that we could each team could each team member could develop their own team. And then each of those could develop their own team. Some people call this the snowflake, but really it's a form of distributed leadership, a form of leadership that develops more leadership, more leadership, more leadership in the work, not by going to the seminar on leadership development, but by how the work is actually done. And finally, in organizing, we operate within a time frame. And Stephen Jay Gould, the paleontologist, said uh, there's two ways to think about time. Time is an arrow, which he called the rhythm of change. And time is a cycle, the rhythm of continuity. And campaigns are time as an arrow. It has a specific beginning. It has a clear objective. And it builds capacity as it moves along. That's why it's going up. These peaks each mean a new capacity. Like now we have enough volunteers, we can form teams. Now we have enough teams, we can contact voters. Now it isn't just more, it is a qualitative capacity that we've created in the road as we move along it. And so it isn't waiting for a grant to start the organizing campaign, it's developing the resources needed in the course of the campaign. So, okay, now I'm just gonna, we're, we're short on time, so I'm gonna zip through this now. Um, I just want to say a bit more about these practices, relationship building. Um, we've all had experience with relationships. Sometimes we think it's all about being the same. Actually relationships about, they're about a balance between commonality and difference. If there's no difference, it's not an interesting relationship, is it? I mean, what do you have to talk about? What do you learn from each other? You know, sometimes you see folks been together for a long time, they got nothing to say to each other. That's not so great. The point is that, that there is something that we are able to, in, we have something of value for the other person. The other person has something of value for us. And it's based on that, we decide to form a relationship. Now, it's not just a transaction. It's not just quid pro quo. And that's where the word commitment comes in. Because it's not enough the transaction. The question is, are there values that we share? Values that we really do share so that we have an interest, not just in that exchange, but in continuing to learn and work with one another. It's a values foundation rather than an issues foundation for building relationships. And we've been focusing a whole lot this, of, of this in, in the work I've been doing recently in, in teaching is getting at the values foundations. And, but there's no relationship without the commitment. You know, uh, maybe you've had coffee with somebody you thought it was a really interesting conversation. You said, let's get together next week. And they say, oh, I got some relatives coming from out of town. Well, what about next week? I got to study for an exam. What about next week? Well, why don't I email you? Okay. What just happened? You know what happened. You got dumped because there was no, no, it's because there was no commitment. See, commitment is what drives relationships. And one of the problems we're having these days with this very, very fragmented, individualistic, transactional way of interacting with one another is we're not making the commitments. And when we don't make the commitments, we're not building anything. We're not constructing anything. We're not building uh, an organization, a movement, or anything else. So the core practice in relationship building that we teach is the one-on-one -on -one meeting, which is about how to meet with another person uh, and engage in a serious conversation 
about why they care, why you care, what you might, how you might share, how you might have be able to create value by sharing with one another in the future. So it's not just sign up by petition or come to my meeting. It's like, hey, do we have enough shared here that we could commit to working with each other? And then in that context, we do and develop all this other stuff. That's often the piece that's missing. We just approach it transactionally. And this is much more fruitful. The second is storytelling. And you know, how many people have had any contact with public narrative? Some folks. Yeah, the whole idea of storytelling is that stories are one way in which we can access the emotional resources embedded in our values. The emotional resources embedded in our values that confront disruptions, not with, not as a threat, fearfully, but as a challenge, hopefully. In other words, the narrative, oops. Oh, no, 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 no. There, yes. Yeah, the basic of narrative is the narrative moment. It is a moment. It is a moment in which there is a, a, a disruption, a challenge, uh, there is a response and there is an outcome. And so, you know, if you think what takes a plot to make a plot a plot, you know, I got up here and started talking, not very interesting, uh, but, uh, or I came from, you know, where I was staying. It only gets interesting if there's a disruption, right? Like the tube broke down or like, uh, you know, somebody stole the car or anything like that starts to create interest. Uh, before then, we're not interested. See, it's a breach in the continuity of what's expected. And, and it is a moment of change. I can say I was watching a beautiful sunset with my partner and the sunset was setting and it was really beautiful and turned orange and pink. Or I can say I was watching a beautiful sunset with my partner and it started to rain. I turned to go, but she grabbed my arm. She said, wait a second, it's only rain. As long as we're together, we're good. Something happened. See, there was a change. That's a narrative moment. That's a narrative moment, which is different than just descriptive moments. And what those moments teach us, because we can identify empathetically with the character in a story moment, because we can identify, we experience the emotional content of the moment, not just a moral like haste makes waste. We actually experience haste making waste. It becomes part of our experience. And that way it becomes a resource for us when we're confronting disruptions and challenges. Oh, I remember that. I mean, where'd you hear your first stories? From the Storytellers Union. Where, where'd you hear your first stories? Where'd you hear? Yeah, yeah. What, so why your parents or your caregivers, why are you telling those stories? To keep you busy, right? But why else? If you, yeah, yeah, if you have kids, you tell, and sort of, you know, so then why not just give them a list? Do this, don't do this. Done. Does it work? Why didn't it work? It's all up here. There's no experience. When they tell you the story about Uncle Charlie and this, that, and the other, or Aunt Harriet, this, that, or the other, you are then you are getting the emotional content, the meaning, the source of courage, the source of hope, the source of solidarity, and that's what you take away from. It. And so narrative is a way to, to articulate, share, uh, and develop the expression of values. And so what we learn to do is teach narrative in the form of how to tell a story of self, why you've been called to what you've been called to, how to tell a story of us, how to remind people of moments of experience that reflect something we share. You know, it's like happens at a family dinner. You ever been to a family dinner and people say, remember the time that? or remember when you're about to hear a story of us. Someone will tell this story that will remind everybody who we are. Oh, we're funny, oh, we're, we're, we're critical, we're whatever it is. After a ball game, same thing, right? What do we talk about? Oh, did you see that? Yeah, that was really cool. Those are all narrative moments. And we're sharing them because they express values that we share. That's a story of us. And then the story of now is about how to make the present moment a narrative moment, a moment of challenge, a moment in which we find sources of hope, and a moment in which we must make choices about how to proceed. Strategizing is the next one. 
And if you think so far, relationship story you can think of, it's about why. Strategy is about how. And uh, the definition I found most useful, it's turning what you have into what you need to get what you want. And like I say, it gets way over complexified, uh, often because people say, we're the people up here, we are making strategy and nobody can understand it except us. Well, that's a problem, you know, because they're making choices without the information they need, which is out there in the world. And, and so part of the deal is this uh, image, the word strategy comes from the Greek. Uh, strata was the word for field. And, and the army was called the strata. And the strata was deployed uh, in order to win a battle. And the general was called the strategos. And the strategos was up on the hill and looking over the battlefield and figuring out how to deploy his troops and how the enemy would be likely to respond. He was really developing a theory of change. He was developing a hypothesis of how it might go. Now, the folks down in the valley, they were called tacticas. This is where we get strategy and tactics. These were the ranks of soldiers called tacticas. They were the activities, they were the action that was being taken. So this is kind of the theory and the action. Now, the trouble comes when fog settles between the two. And the one up on the hill thinks they've got the whole truth because they can see the big picture. Sometimes the people down here in the valley think they got the whole truth because they know the local reality. You ever hear this? Come on. The problem is neither one has, whoops. Wait, what happened? Oh no. What happened? Going through it quickly here. Storytelling. Okay. Yeah, back there. Now, the problem becomes that each of them has a piece of reality. And in other words, uh, at the local level, yeah, you know the context really well, but from the mountaintop, you can put the context in context, in a broader context, kind of see. But from the mountaintop, you don't know the specific context, the local context. So people tend to just say this, say this, you know, they send out uh, packaged scripts that you just, I don't know if it happens here in the US, it's a big deal. Just say this exactly. And yeah, I'm just the cog in the machine. What's my responsibility? What do I do here? So strategizing, we think of it as a verb, not a noun, uh, because it's not like you make a plan and then you're done. Uh, you know, General Eisenhower, after the D-Day invasion said, planning is really important, but plans are useless. And what he meant was that that's, the planning process gets us on a similar uh, framework. But once the action starts, no, that's when the strategizing starts because you're learning this worked, this didn't work, this was a mistake. And unless you have a strategy team that is capable and able to do adaptive strategizing, then you wind up just going off somewhere and the world changes without you. So pink of it as a word. Finally, uh, or almost finally, acting, uh, acting meaning mobilizing and deploying resources. In other words, mobilizing, well, like mobilizing the Montgomery bus boycott, mobilizing people's feet and deploying their feet in the form of a boycott. In other words, or mobilizing somebody's money and deploying it in the form of hiring a staff or, or something, or mobilizing somebody's dues or mobilizing somebody's expertise. The idea is to mobilize resources, but then deploy them strategically. And it depends on these two things, on Understanding how commitments really work, that I'll try is not a commitment. I'll try is I'll try. And it's often very hard for us to, you know, take the tension, well, yes or no. And really, without that, nothing's happening. Uh, and uh, the other is motivation, is designing work that we ask people to do that's inherently motivational. It isn't just like same thing over and over and over and over. And we know there's a way to design tasks that are inherently motivational. So that's the action. And structuring uh, just means doing the work to articulate a shared purpose, uh, methods for decision-making, accountability, and difference, dealing with difference, roles and responsibilities. Now, I don't know, I've been doing some work with the Sunrise Movement uh, in, in the US, uh, which is about uh, climate change movement. But boy, they had a hard time with structure. 
really hard. Lots of energy, lots of mobilization, lots of deployment, but the structure was a challenge. And so then it turns out it's a little bit like uh, in the cartoons, Wile E. Coyote. I don't know if folks remember Wile E. Coyote where, you know, the roadrunner and all that. And, and Wile E. Coyote is running off the cliff and he looks down and there's nothing there. Well, it, gee, that comms strategy was great, but what do we build? They didn't build anything. And so taking structure seriously and leadership development, because unless this is built into the daily work, of a, of a campaign where things are crafted in such a way as to notice people, as to create opportunities for people, as to ratchet up potential responsibility, then you're not really doing leadership development. And almost any task can be turned into an opportunity for leadership development if that's what's on your mind. So I think this last slide, oh, one minute. Oh, okay. We often find people confusing mobilizing and organizing. And, you know, mobilizing being turning out people for that rally, turning out people for that action, turning out people for the demonstration. And they all show, and people get turned out. Usually something motivational happens. So then we say, oh, in reaction to this, let's go do that. And so everybody shows up uh, and then they go away. And what changed? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, the most compelling lesson is really why going to the, the Google guy from Tahrir Square, who was involved in that mobilization when they got rid of Mubarak, was saying they were great mobilizers. They were so effective in mobilizing, they got rid of Mubarak, but they had not built organization. As a result, it was the Muslim brothers who had the organization who came in and harvested the benefits of their mobilization. So distinguishing between mobilizing and organizing is really important. You know, it used to be like when 250,000 people showed up in Washington, the March on Washington, 1963, boy, that was getting 250,000 people. That was really something. These days, it's like, oh, somebody sent out a good, uh, you know, it was good social media. And opposition doesn't take it seriously unless it's a demonstration of power. And that's where the organization piece comes in. And so this is contrasting mobilizing, advocacy, services, and so forth. A lot of ways to solve a problem, but it's only organizing that builds organization, develops leadership, and that's how we build and develop power. So thank you. I think we're done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brenda, would you like to come up and sit up here? That would be excellent. Thank you very much. So um, we have Brenda Prem Kumar, who is one of our brilliant district and branch secretaries for Redbridge in NEU. And she's got a bit of a challenge to put to Marshall and hopefully Marshall's going to help her draw out what some of those solutions might be. Yeah. Um, Don't expect answers. Oh, we need the sound. Do you want to say a little bit about how we organise Redbridge? Yeah, shall I start with that? Yeah, so, okay, look, this is not rehearsed, okay? Uh, it's not rehearsed, but I thought it might be interesting to uh, demonstrate something about coaching, because coaching is not the same thing as giving advice. Coaching is asking questions, and it's a way we can support one another through coaching. It's really when we say leadership as an evil Coaching is a way to enable. It's very different than saying, do this, do that, boom. It is trying to draw out solutions or trying to draw out understanding. And so it's an interdependent form of leadership practice and learning. And we thought we'd take a shot here at uh, seeing how it works. So I hear you have a challenge. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm the district secretary for. Redbridge. It is, it's a, you know, very vibrant uh, district, even if I say so myself. We've got about 3,500 uh, members with about 83 schools. 
and about 90 reps. Um, it's been, you know, organizing for this uh, pay campaign has been absolutely incredible because, you know, for the first time we are seeing such huge member um, engagement. Uh, I mean, I think one of our best results was in the indicative, we've got 81% of our members, uh, you know, uh, turn out. Um, you can coach me. <laughs> not at all, not at all. I'm here for answers. So, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's been such an exciting and hi historic time. I think also, you know, from our members' point of view, I think for the first time we are really proving, you know, what the union is there for, and they're really recognizing uh, the the power of, of, of the union because it's having a real time kind of, you know, real life impact uh, on, on their on, on their lives. Um, and so, I, I, even last week, I went to a, a members' meeting and. Uh, one of the members really wanted to talk about the demonstrations he's been on and uh, and and the rallies he's been part of and the picket lines he was part of. And he concluded by saying, I feel, you know, now I kind of understand there's, 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 there's power in the union. And for me, that was just so, you know, such a wonderful thing to hear because that shows there's so much potential going forward about what members are then able to take away um, from 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 this uh, pay campaign, so but really, <laughs> so really the challenge is is about um, the reps and activists uh, who work with us. Uh, we are we are so lucky to have such committed, uh, passionate um, um, activists. Uh, but as as a branch, um, we we ask so much of them. But we're also very very conscious that in education, workload, excessive workload. Uh, is is a real real problem so when we're asking our reps and our activists to do something it is on top of what they are already doing um in in schools and this is a nine to five you know this is a this is a full-time job um with with lots of um, um hours that they put in um outside of uh, of the time and with families um uh, uh, and work-life balance uh, to to kind of sort out as well so it's about um how you know how can we ask our reps to do so much more i mean ideally as a branch secretary i would love for them to have union work at the forefront of what they do <laughs> now how long have you been doing union work um i say that about um i'd say about eight years seven eight, eight years. years yes what got you started um well it was um one of one so uh, our rep uh, stepped down and uh, um someone else asked me to step up yeah but why did you step up um <laughs> i think there, there was a campaign and there, there was a move to academize our school and our union group got together and we kind of you know shut it down and for me that proved that actually unions do something and so i thought it was important to step up but why I mean, there's other people I'm sure that thought it was important, but you stepped up. Why? Um, a bit of a mug, I think. I mean, I didn't ask too many questions. <laughs> I was just like, you know, friend is asking. I have a lot of respect for them, and I haven't really questioned what they do. I think it's all very important what they do, and I just kind of didn't ask too many questions. Just went along. Yeah, that's how you live life. It's just you're not asking very many questions. Yeah. I don't think so. Not all the time, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, what, what was it that moved you? I mean, what was it, and why did you care so much that you would actually do that? Um, well, I, I think um, every meeting I'd been to, every conversation I had resonated with me. There what? wasn't, um, I suppose I'm passionate about education. I suppose. When did you get passionate about education? I think, um, interestingly, it was when I became more involved in the union, my passion for education just became so much more stronger because I kind of understood just how much problems we're facing as educators. And actually, the answer to that is being part of a collective that is uh, going to defend um, a good quality education. And I saw union activists doing when that. you were already teaching. I was already teaching. Why, why, yeah. why did you? Teach. Sorry? Why did you become a teacher? Because I suppose I believed in the power of education and it's in its uh, and in my own lived experience. Uh, you know, I, I kind of realized that actually it can take you from 
one place to another. What, what was that experience? Um, my mother is illiterate yeah. and my dad never actually finished education um, past the age of 14. And, um, you know, and when I came, uh, I came to this country when I was um, eight and uh, I didn't actually, I didn't know the alphabet. I need three letters of the alphabet. And, uh, you know, and then I kind of went through the education system and I realized actually I'm a, you know, I can, I am a very articulate person in when, control when of you, my life. When did you realize that? When did I realize yeah, that? Yeah, you're going through the education system. When, when did you get, oh, hey, I'm a pretty articulate person. Um, I suppose it was, um, I, I had a educator myself, a, 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 an A-level English teacher who, who well, this, well, gave me a very strong, um, a, who, who gave me a sense of belief in myself. What was the name of that person? Uh, Mr. Owens, Robert Owens. What grade is that? Uh, this is in A levels. This is uh, uh, high, high school. 17, 18. Yeah, 17, 18. Yeah. yeah, what did he say? What did he say? He just thought I had strengths and I could do I could do English, uh, which is uh, you know, which is which is quite empowering for me because for the first time I'm discovering that I'm good at something and I want to do that more and more of that. Yeah, and you believed him. I believed him, yes, uh, yeah. Yeah, and so you wanted to do what he had done for you, for others? Yes. Or what, why? Because it's worthwhile, it's meaningful. But why for others? Um, hmm. I can't, I don't know, it's just, it's just something. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know how to rationalize it. It's just something I wanted to do. It's really interesting to explore that a bit because a lot of people may have experience in the educational system of succeeding. And so I'm going to become an investment banker. Uh, they don't say, I want to offer to others what I receive. That's kind of an important, you know, where that might come from. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it's, there's a sense of, I feel personally, as there's a sense of purpose that I'm fulfilling when I'm doing that. Yes. And it fits in with my values personally. And so I suppose it kind of aligns in that way. And those values came from where? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's quite a deep question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, where do they come from? Uh, family experiences, just. Did you come up in a faith tradition or cultural practices or? Uh, not, not really, no, not mm. faith. I suppose culture plays a, yeah. a big role. Family, commitment to family plays a role. So uh, you're not just a loner? No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it matters to have that other people can give you like this. Yeah. yeah. So, First, thank you for responding to these questions. Now, what does this have to do with the challenge that you pose to me? I think I want to be a responsible branch secretary in that I'm not pushing my activists too much to the point they give up, or I'm not asking enough of them that they're passive. Here, here's the As you reflect on your own experience in finding this, this calling, uh, this work, stepping up for it, continuing to do it. What is there to learn about my, what might help others the same thing? I think people generally, um, as they mature, maybe want to give back and uh, they want to do something that isn't just about improving themselves. They feel a part of a community yeah. and they want to do something that gives meaning to them yeah. um, and that, um, you know, is, is, is in some way fulfilling their, uh, their values uh, about, about giving back to people and doing the right things. And when you invite people to your rep, rep, is that what you're offering them? I think so. Yes. Do they know that? Um, uh, I think we try to have discussions that are, uh, yeah, I, I, I think people understand what we're engaged in is um, enabling others, empowering others, how, and that's important to do. How, how do they experience that? 
or it's not just like this is what we do, but how does that become part of their experience? How, how, how do they experience yeah, that? Yeah, in other words, it's kind of like, you know, uh, well, just as an example, like hope is an abstraction, but if I experience hopefulness in the context of an organizational movement, then I'm hopeful. It's an experience. And what you're describing is an experience that matters. It makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It enables me to be the person I want to be. That's what you seem to be. So I guess what I'm saying is, in what way are you making that kind of experience available? Um, okay. um, I suppose we share lots of stories in uh, meetings of where we have, uh, where members have taken action yeah. and they have changed things and uh, where that's led to better outcomes. Yeah. So, and I, and I think listening to that, I think others kind of feel like, yeah, what the union does is important. It kind of, you know, empowers individuals, it empowers yeah. groups of people and it's where you can make so, change. So who are these people? that you're so, you're so concerned about asking them to do too much? Uh, um, so reps, activists? Well, like, for example, uh, you, can, you, can, you can use a fake name, but whatever. But for example. So we've got, we've, we've got two, two activists, I suppose. Um, one, of them, uh, one of them is called Mo. He's, he's brilliant, he's, he's newly married, and every time I ask him to do something, I feel like I'm taking him away from... Now, does he tell you that, or you feel that way? I feel like that. Why? That, Why? Uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think it's important people have time to rest from such yeah. an onerous yeah. job. But why, should, why would you say no for him? Sorry? Why would you say no for him? Good question. Why would I? Because he's more than capable of saying no to me. You know? <laughs> so, believe me. Yeah. No, no. So, what do you think that's about? That, um, oh, I don't want to press him. Uh, I wonder what it is, but I get what I think I understand where you're, where you're getting at. They can say no to me. Yeah. Um, ask, ask yeah. them, but they can say yeah, no it, to me. It's a good Not an expert on this. You've lived it. Yeah. You've lived it. This is not something to make up. Do you think he has a lot he could learn from you? Oh God, that's a bit embarrassing. I I mean, hopefully, yes, because I don't just say things. I mean, I think I do and I improve and I so what if you give him the opportunity for that kind of learning? Um I think he'd be fantastic, and, and and in fact, you know, I don't think he has too much to learn. I think he's he's brilliant uh, already. He's got a lot of potential. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's an opportunity, yeah. as opposed yeah. in a way. Yeah. So, um, what what what's next? In other words, we've had this conversation. Oh, what what action comes out of this? What, what are you going to do? I think I'm still going to be making judgments about, you know, I mean, obviously, I want to get the best out of my activists, which means not overwhelming them with too many activities and too many things and commitments. How do you, how do you know but, if you're overwhelming them? Um, so I, I suppose it's about having conversations mm -hmm. and, you know, saying, what do you think about this? And how about coming along to this? And having those conversations and where, <clears throat> you know, there is, you know, I'm not just sending things out, but we're actually talking about it and say, what are you doing this, you know, this weekend or next week? Or, you know, how do you feel about chairing this meeting? Um, and yeah, so I suppose I think having conversations, so I'm not just making assumptions. Do you ever, share, do you ever share how much you've learned and grown as a result of this work that you've been doing? Not enough, I think. Yeah. Not, not enough, not enough. Um, I think sometimes you feel like, you know, you just want to share the successes and you don't so much go into the the, the struggles. Although I must say, um, I, I've had a dispute in my own school and it's been brilliant because I've been sh sharing quite a lot of the obstacles and the difficulties. So even as a district secretary, I'm facing and I'm in exactly the same situation as every one of my reps. 
that is facing. And in fact, you know, I, I'd say there's, there's some things that I haven't even won on, and I'm quite open about sharing that. Well, look, you have a lot to teach. You have a lot to share. And, you know, sometimes we focus too much on the cost and not enough on the benefit. Mm. You know, sometimes people think that people volunteer because it's easy. But they don't. They volunteer if it's valuable. It's a big difference. See, sometimes we focus so much on reducing cost that that doesn't get it. It's the value. And uh, you think you can create some real value with this person we've been talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I see him as a future leader, you know. So when are you going to talk to him? <laughs> soon <laughs> how soon right so what we've got we've got a meeting coming up next week and uh last week he was uh, last meeting he was doing the technical support you know i think he can step up a little bit more and take up uh um you know more of a a play uh more of a role taking a segment of the meeting so is that next week that is next tuesday yeah next tuesday yeah Okay, well, it'd be great to check in and see how it goes. <laughs> I promise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, so as I promised at the start, we do ha now have some time for questions, but I must apologise, I didn't welcome everybody who is online at the start. So I have got a computer here. If you have any questions online, please do start putting them in. Um, and we do have some roving mics in the room as well. So, so it's just, just I just want to ask Bender. Bender, yeah. Bender, yeah, what was your experience with this? What, what do you take away from this? from just this our, whole our, session no from our conversation just now from our from our conversation um i think like you say um what we've got to offer in the union is something so valuable and um it is an opportunity for individuals to uh you know be involved in something that they gain a lot from as well and so to treat uh you know the involvement in the union not necessarily as asking them to do too much but actually it's an opportunity for them to do things that is a you know that hopefully they see as a value con valuable contribution and that they grow through as well so what kinds of questions by asking that were helpful Oh, that went so fast. I can't, <laughs> I can't remember. I feel like we went to my family, we yeah. went to my education, yeah. we went to my own experiences as a trade unionist. I suppose a lot of it was focused on me and what got me engaged and me stay in and turn, turn up meeting after meeting and, you know, like keep kind of keep going. Those kind of questions, yeah. Because the idea of coaching is not to give advice. Yes. It is to ask questions. Yeah. And this is why coaching is so valuable. You know, there's a Yiddish riddle who discovered water. And the answer is, I don't know, but it wasn't a fish. It's supposed to be funny. But, <laughs> but, but we're all fish in the water of our own stories and our own experiences. And the value of coaching is someone who is not in that, but who is interested, who cares, and can ask questions. And we can be such valuable resources to each other just in that way, just in that way. So I just wanted to underscore that. And, and again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so you. much. That was a really interesting conversation. Thank you very much both. Um, so we do have around 15 minutes for questions and um, I'm hoping there's lots of questions. I would like to get as many people and yeah. many contributions in as possible. So I will ask if you, if you have, Got a question if you can try and keep it relatively concise um the more concise you are the more people that we can bring in to ask something so who's going to be brave and go first brilliant that oh, your, your hand was up first i'm afraid yes just there with the glasses on and the blue flag we share Marsha, would you like to take one at a time or three in a maybe section? maybe we should, should get a couple yeah, okay. yeah. yeah we'll take, thank you and then and, and a person to say who you are and, and you know and where you're from yeah. Thanks very much. My name's Lynn Collins. I work for the Royal College of Midwives at the moment, but previously worked for the TUC and did some uh, women's development programmes. So I wanted to ask a question about uh, gender and organising. 
Um, the women we worked with tended to be a bit better at telling the story of us than the story of self. Uh, and we needed to do lots of confidence building uh, to emphasize how important our own stories are. And I just wondered if you could share any examples of where organizing campaigns have built the confidence of women to tell that story of self. Brilliant question. Thank you, Lynn. And then just over there in the back corner with the black. And it's lovely to see him personally. And I follow you on Twitter. <laughs> so this is why these are so lovely. It's funny because I now have two questions, but I can only ask one, can't I? Um, hi, I'm Caroline from the Trust of Trust. And my question is, um, what do you think are the key differences between organising in the UK and the US? Well, let me, let me just respond to the first. Um, the organising online class that I teach, uh, we, have a, we just finished, we have 140 students in about 30 countries. And 46% um, are where English is not their first language, but 68% are women. And the average age is around 35. One of, I think, the most important things happening in the world right now is the, is the, 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 the gender revolution, is the women's movement. And I work with people in the Middle East, in India, all over the place. And boy, that's where there's a lot of energy and a lot of action. What you're describing is not surprising, but it's also a shame that it's not. Uh, Sewa is an organization in, uh, in Gujarat, in India, that uh, has done a lot of work there. It's a, like a women's trade union co-op whole thing. And I met the education director and I asked her, well, what do you do when somebody joins? She said, well, first thing they do is they, uh, they uh, work on enabling them to tell their story. I said, well, why that? Well, when they come, there's somebody's wife, there's somebody's daughter, there's somebody's sister, there's somebody's aunt, they're not somebody. And so the very first thing they have to do is the somebody. And I think that's where the work is, you know, because there's all these different, but that's where the work is. We were just involved in a campaign in Lebanon with the Syrian refugee community where uh, they did a campaign to stop child marriage. Now, that's something you can't do from the outside the inside and the leaders were women who had gone through that experience they wanted not just to be survivors they wanted to be organizers and they took the leadership and this thing was amazingly successful they even organized the thing for courageous fathers in other words each house was asked to put up a sign no child marriage in this house that was really something so these resources are there they're within us and I just think you put your finger on what is so critical, but it's always there. It just has to be drawn out. And the more that people are working together with each other to do this, that's where it comes. And, you know, I mean, the real, how can I say, the real craft is in doing of it. And uh, I would just love to see how you're doing it uh, because it's really, really important. Thank you for that question. On the other question, I'm going to dodge because I just got the UK. I mean, I, you know, I could be, you know, I could be legitimately ignorant here. Uh, I mean, I certainly have a lot to say about the US, which is uh, very challenging, very challenging circumstances. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess, I mean, to make a long hand short, uh, long story short, I'm convinced that unless we build a movement, that's capable of turning over some, some traces, turning over some stuff. Um, and I don't know what I mean specifically about that. It's just not a business as usual time. And our electoral system is so sclerotic and so problematic and oligarchic, frankly, that the only ways in American history that deep change has happened has been the result of disruptions, whether it's a war or depression or a social movement. And social movements have had a very particular role in American history. There's a great book by a guy named Dan Schlossman when movements anchor parties and the interaction between movement and party and how without the movements, the parties would not change. And sometimes the parties co-opt, sometimes the parties get co-opted and so forth. But it's a dynamic between in and out. And that's where I think we have to go now. 
Um, I think climate is a fundamental thing and the urgency is just not there and it has to be there if we're really gonna deal with it. You know, not to mention all the consequences of the inequality, the way in which we're dehumanized. I mean, in so many different ways, you know, we're turned into data points or we're turned into utility functions. Actually, a colleague and I, we're gonna have a, uh, a study group this, uh, this uh, coming fall called Being Human, you know, which ought not to be a question, but it kind of is. And in a way, AI draws it even more clearly because we everybody's freaked out about AI. AI is a logic machine. Human consciousness is so much more than a logic machine. It's embedded in emotion. It's embedded in our bodies. It's about life. And so appreciating what it is that makes us human and making claims based demanding that kind of humanity from the system, somehow that figures into a movement of some kind. I think organized labor is a critical part of this. And that's one reason I really appreciate the opportunity uh, here with the Teachers Union, um, because it is about power, but it's about movement. I don't, that's the best I can do. I, I can't tell you about, you're here, you tell me about here. Uh, I'm here to learn, not to, not to tell. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Haven't got any come in online yet. So if you are online and you'd like to put a question in, we will bring you in. We've just got over there in the back with the white shirt. And then is anyone else on this side as well? Brilliant. Thank you. Hiya, uh, I'm Matt. I'm an organizer at the NEU. Um, in the UK union movement, uh, which is very well represented here, we've got very well established structures. And you articulated really well the importance about building structures through a campaign to make sure that that kind of change in power is, is embedded and sustainable. I just wonder if you could make some comments on that about, you know, what you do with the kind of existing structures and how you kind of work with these existing structures or build new ones to make sure that kind of progress and these big high lift moments that we're all experiencing uh, are, are sustainable. It's really hard, isn't it? No, what I mean is, you know, there's a tension between continuity and change. Campaigns and organizing, they're all about change. They're all about moving from here to there. Organizations tend to be much more about continuity, predictability, how this. And so there's a tension. And I think the question is how to manage that tension, which I don't think is particularly easy. In other words, organizational leadership, if organizational leadership is not open to change and you know, there's a saying, quoting Spanish, Mexican sayings, entre menos burros, más elotes. It means the fewer the donkeys, the more the corn. Sometimes new leadership, oh, wait, I don't want new leadership. I'm not done being a leader. And so there, there's the, those dynamics that have to be taken on in one way or another. Because if not, then the, dyna the dynamism and the vitality of the union goes away and it becomes stuck and it becomes stagnant. But creating structures that enable challenge, it's, it's one of the things that you know, I think is so important to start to figure out how to make where dissent is not disloyalty. That dissent is a different perspective from which and with which we can learn. That's easy to say, but turning that into actual practice. I mean, so there's no easy answer to this. I, I think you named a major challenge. And there are a lot of things that are tensions that aren't resolvable, but they have to be managed. And this change in continuity is one of them. You can't go all continuity, then you die. All change, well, then you're not building anything. And so it's, it's, it's how they're integrated and how you balance one with the other. And that we learn through experiment and through practice and through the book you're gonna write and tell us how you've learned to do it. No, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I hope that you explore this with real, it, it's not something come from the outside, it's gotta come from within. Uh, and it's generational, certainly is often part of it. So, you know, I don't wanna speak for existing union leadership, I don't wanna get in any trouble here, but no, but, but I think this is dynamic that just has to be faced for the labor movement to have a vital future. Yeah, thank you for the question. Really, really appreciate it. Good question, thank you. And then just in the gray jump over there, thank you. 
Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm Catherine. I'm an organiser with Resource Justice. And I was really interested in hearing you talking about relationships and emotion and storytelling. And something that concerns me is how we guard against manipulation when we're working with these different things because it can be really easy that in the heightened emotion of a story, someone feels really driven to say yes. Um, but how do we know if that is genuinely what they're wanting and are aligned and feel called, or if they're being pushed and pulled by what we're doing as organizers? Like, are you the person or are you the person telling the story? Or the, like, what's your perspective on this? So I worry that when I'm organizing and I'm having one-to-ones, I'm heightening through relationship and through storytelling, and the desire in someone else to join with me and take action. Uh, and I'm curious, like, is that okay ethically? Do you think you're that powerful? Sometimes. <laughs> no, no, but really, in other words, isn't it come from within them? See, speaking the language of emotion is so important because, you know, where does courage come from? You know, where, how do we get rid of fear? Where does the power of love, of solidarity, where does that come from? And that's enabling. But I think it's also important to respect the fact that people make choices. And so, you know, how can I say, offering a person the kind of support that could encourage them to make a courageous choice, it's only manipulation if it's, uh, how can I put it, if it's opaque, uh, and if it's in behalf of an interest that's not there. I think the difference between intentionality and manipulation is really important. And a lot of it has to do with whether it's opaque or whether it's transparent. And when we exercise craft, that's craft, that's intentionality, of course. Is it manipulation? Well, I think you have to ask yourself that question. The other perspective on this is that those guys have no hesitancy about this at all. And, you know, we if we take the position oh, they're just emotional and they don't know anything. And, you know, we're rational. We're, yeah, well, yeah, wake me up because uh, we're missing the boat. It is an emotional, it's a narrative debate as much as it is about policy or anything else. It's about meaning. It's about values. And if we are not as articulate, more articulate than they are, and fearful of making, the, of speaking that kind of language, then I think we really, there's no comparison. I think we just lose. It's kind of one of the things that's different. One of the frustrations I have in the States is that defending ourselves against stuff is enough when really it needs to be much clearer what it is. I think, and there is a lot of values work to do there, a lot of relational work to do there. You know, in the States, everybody talks about things are polarized as if it were symmetrical, as if there's this powerful hard right and there's this powerful hard left. Well, I don't find that. I haven't found it. I don't know where it exists. There is a highly polarized right and then everybody else is fragmented. And so it's a question of how to build out of that fragmentation, the kind of unity that, but you don't build unity simply around defending yourself. And that's where the values come in. What are we for? What are we trying to build? What is this world we're trying to create? Isn't it possible that the challenge of climate change offers an opportunity to create a genuinely humane society, which we don't have? So it's trying to, to, to move forward in that way. Does that make sense? Good question, thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Marsha, as well. Um, so I've got one question online, and um, thank you to Michelle from Save the Children for sending this question in. And Michelle begins by saying, Marshall, thank you for this amazing, beautiful seminar. And her question is, do you think it is possible to get fluent at organising later in life? She says she only found out that she loves doing campaigning in her 40s, and she worries that she's behind and doesn't have enough time to learn but she does have lots of lived experience. What would you recommend? Wait, what was the first part? I didn't quite get it. The first part when she said, thank you, it's a beautiful seminar. No, no, no. <laughs> no, she said, do you think it is possible to get fluent at organizing later in life? Um, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I started my PhD when I was 15. Um, you know, I think we're learning as long as we're open to learning. And, you know, sometimes 
over 40, you don't have to worry about things you have to worry about before 40. Uh, you know, there's a, again, I'm, I'm with Mexican sayings. Uh, I can say con el vino, entre más viejo, más bueno. When we should be like wine, the older the better. Uh, no, I, I, I think that, uh, that you don't say no to yourself. It is, quote, never too late. And I certainly found that in finding the very, the same calling, but in a radically different setting. I mean, if somebody told me I was gonna be teaching at Harvard, I'd say, you're crazy, that's never gonna happen. It was never a plan, it was never intentional. It was about what, it's about what was calling me next. And if she's called to learn, so I'm in. Yeah, I hope you heard me. <laughs> um, I think we've got time for one last question. I think if we're just in the purple top there, thank you very much. And there's another one. Okay. Um, what we're coming across is K from Unite Community. So what we're coming across a lot at the moment is union busting. How do you organise against union busting while trying to organise? Okay. Yeah, let's go get the other Was question. There question on? There's, Thank you. there's another question over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sadaf Musfi and I work for the New Economics Foundation. I'm a community organiser working on London's housing crisis. Um, really broad. <laughs> We're still trying to fix it, um, but <laughs> uh, it's not going anywhere. Um, so uh, the question is, um, that: do you think there's a moment in, uh, in people's life when you're working with organizers and tenants in this case that you take them on the journey of organizing do you think first maybe you have to work on their immediate problems like fixing the mold and the damp and then take them on that journey and through that you build trust because this is a challenge I'm facing not just with the people that um who who are obviously facing the the problems of damp and mold who are reluctant sometimes to you know to, to, to speak, uh, to tell their story or come to a house meeting. And also the partners I'm working with who are very much interested in, you know, getting the council to, to, uh, to, uh, to fix the problem and being an advocate, you know, on behalf of them rather than organizing. And just to come back to the lady um, before me, um, this is the problem I feel that it, it, there's a, a issue in the UK with when it comes to organizing. So a lot of it is like activism and trying to speak on behalf of people rather than enabling them. So do you think first we should, yeah, is there a purist model or a more fluid? Oh, okay, I mean, there's a lot packed into that. <laughs> yeah, I no, I've no, got but, lots of questions, but I try no, to- but, No, it's, it's really good. I mean, just on the union busting, I just want to say, yeah, that's what comes with the territory. They've always tried to do that. They continue to try to do it. And the only way we stop it is to be more powerful. I, I just, I, I, I don't know if any of that, any other, deal there. But on, on this question, um, you know, if, if the, I mentioned the example of the bus boycott. Uh, now, the real problem there was institutionalized racism. Okay? That was a real core problem. So now we say, okay, institutionalized racism is a problem. So now can we imagine a world in which that was solved? No racism. Okay, great. So now how do we get there? I write a seminar paper, uh, give a talk. What's the action? So then maybe we come down a notch and say, well, the problem is segregation. So what do we do to get rid of segregation? Maybe we file a lawsuit. Does that really shift things that much? What if the problem is the segregated bus? Could we imagine a desegregated bus? Yes. Is, it, is the pain real? Yes, it is. Then the question becomes, how do we go about dealing with that real problem in a way that builds power? Do we rely on the lawyer to file a lawsuit? Then who, who gets the power? The lawyer. Do we organize a boycott? Then who gets the power? The whole community. So you come out of it with an empowered or the next step, the next step. The question is how you solve what's there and or try to in a way that builds, that isn't just, just you know, well, we're fighting to have a stop sign way we won. The whole point of fighting to get a stop sign is to build a powerful community. That's, that's the point. And so I don't know if, if how helpful this is, but 
these things are never either or. And but if you're not connecting with people in terms of real needs, you're not connecting with them. You know, it's just not. They should feel this way. No, it doesn't work. How do they feel? How do we engage with that? How do we learn together? And then you can't promise power. You can create the experience of it. This is very different. Like that bus boy, they created the experience. They all stayed off the buses. Wow, look, we're powerful. You create the experience of power. And that's a lot of what organizing is about, is looking for those opportunities in which people can exercise agency and experience. Oh, yes, I do matter. Yes, I can. Yes, we can. So that's about the best I can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marshall. Um, so that does bring us to the end of our evening this evening. However, I do genuinely hope this is the start of a conversation. So I am going to remind you and ask you to please do join the Leading Change Network. You will find leaflets, I believe, on your seats. So please do join up and we can continue this conversation as well. And I just wanted, Marshall, do you want to finish with any final comment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, I just want to conclude with a song, but I'm not going to sing. <laughs> Because in the fourth grade, I was told, please just mouth the words. <laughs> a very evil teacher. I, yeah, you know. No, but uh, uh, no, this was a song Judy Collins recorded in the 60s uh, in the context of the civil rights movement in the US. And um, it uses the word freedom. See, the civil rights movement never called itself the civil rights movement. It called itself the freedom movement. Because freedom is a much bigger idea than, than legal rights. It's it's powerful. It's solidaristic. It's it it is so much more than legal rights. So think of it in that sense. And the song goes: Freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing. Doesn't fall down like the summer rain. Freedom freedom is a hard won thing. You have to work for it. You have to fight for it day and night for it. And every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children, brother. Pass it on to your children, sister. They have to work for it. They have to fight for it. Day and night for it. And every generation has to win it again. Pass it on to your children. Pass it on. And thank you for the opportunity to pass it on. Thank you so much. I'll oh, share one last. I, I think I need to teach you how to apply. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, in the parks, we used to apply like that. A guy named Luis Valdez who, uh, organized something called the Teatro Campesino Farmer Theater. He wrote a lot of song and all that, and, and actos and all to the movement. And he noticed that we applauded that way. And he said, I don't get this. You know, you're, you're supposed to be a movement and you're organized and building momentum, but you just applaud chaotically. <laughs> And so he taught us how to join me here. He taught us how to applaud this way. And there's one more. Uh, we we're doing, we're doing uh, uh, Latino Camp Obama in New Mexico. And a young woman who had been organized in the Filipino community came. She said, that's really cool. Because, I mean, that was known as the Aplauso Campesino, the power of applause. Whenever you heard that in California, Everybody said, oh, it's the farm workers. But she said, we don't think it has enough solidarity. So she added one element. So join me. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marshall. Honestly, I could sit and listen to you all evening. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here this evening. And I want to thank everybody who has helped to organize this evening and put a bit of work in behind the scenes as well. Thank you to you all for coming and everybody who has joined us online as well. Thank you ever so much. Thank you.